welcome back everyone. Today is day 21 of our Ignatian spiritual exercises. And I, as I said earlier in the previous weeks, this conference is not me giving the conference. You know, it's the Holy Spirit who's going to work in your soul. And so I hope all the words that I speak will be, um, you know, from the Holy Spirit. And really the goal of our uh, exercise that we are two-thirds of the way there is to allow the Holy Spirit to soften our hearts, to allow the Holy Spirit to make us gentle, mild, and docile, and to find those moments of prayer in our life that we don't um, have those moments of prayer and those conversations and dialogue with our Lord and our Blessed Mother and the saints just for these 30 days but they become a way of life. So that's the transformation. So these are all interior transformation. So if you're not visibly seeing some huge changes, you can be rest assured the transformation is happening. And later, like after we're done with our 30 days, when you're gonna reflect back, you're gonna see how the Holy Spirit worked in your life not only in you, but even in your situations, the different expectations that you came with, uh, that we reflected on the very first day before we started our exercises. So you can have high confidence because we fail, but the Holy Spirit never fails. So you can be confident that whatever your expectations, the Holy Spirit is going to take care of it. So with that, I prepared this um, prayer of protection uh, that I wrote last year, that I'd like to begin with that prayer. And then I wrote a little poem on the Eucharist this morning that I'd like to also, you know, pray together with you. And then we pray the uh, Anima Christi, which is on page 304. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear Jesus, you are the uncreated Word of God through whom everything came into existence. Yet you became man so as to make us divine. You became the work of human hands so we can receive you, be nourished by you, and be transformed into you. We are your living tabernacles, where you abide in us and work through us. We implore you, Jesus, to command these unholy spirits, demons, Satan, and his allies to leave God's children, created in his image and likeness, and never return. We implore you, Jesus, to command them to leave all the animals, birds, fish, plants, and all things both living and non-living, found on land, sea, or air, and never return again. May there be an end to all divisions, harmful competition, destruction of lives and property. May these be replaced with unity, collaboration, building up of lives and society. May there be an outpouring of the Holy Spirit who brings healing, peace, harmony, and reconciliation. May we seek ways to help one another and radiate your divine love. Help us to especially love those who wish us ill. Give us your heart, for we are unable to love them as you do. We ask this in your mighty name, Jesus, and through the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Amen. Jesus, I come to you. Jesus is the seed that waits to be sown. Jesus is the seed that dies for its own. Jesus is the seed that reverts to wheat stalks. 
Jesus is the wheat stalk that waits for the grains. Jesus is the wheat grain that waits to be harvested. Jesus is the grain that waits to become dry. Jesus is the flower. Jesus is the grain that waits to be ground. Jesus is the flower that waits to become bread. Jesus is the bread that waits to become flesh. Jesus gives us flesh and waits for you to come. So come, let us eat his flesh. Jesus is the seed that waits to be sown. Jesus is the seed that dies for its own. Jesus is the seed that reverts to grapevine. Jesus is the vine that waits for the grapes. Jesus is the grape that waits to become ripe. Jesus is the grape that waits to be harvested. Jesus is the grape that waits to be crushed. Jesus is a grape that waits to become wine. Jesus is the wine that waits to become blood. Jesus gives his blood and waits for you to come. So come, let us eat his flesh and drink his blood to receive his strength and his life. Amen. Anima Christi, soul of Christ, sanctify me. Body of Christ, save me. Blood of Christ, inebriate me. Water from the side of Christ, wash me. Passion of Christ, strengthen me. O good Jesus, hear me. Within thy wounds, hide me. Separated from thee, let me never be. From the malignant enemy, defend me. At the hour of my death, call me. And bid me come unto thee, that with thy saints I may praise thee for all eternity. Amen. So last week we kind of were still on week three. The meditations were on the Eucharist. So that's what inspired me to write this poem for us this morning. And we also reflected on the passion of Jesus that was a main focus especially in the Garden of Olives and we know that often Jesus went away to lonely places to play or to pray and he took a few disciples with him as he did on the Feast of the Transfiguration which we celebrate today so happy Feast of the Transfiguration and he took Peter, James, and John, and, you know, he was at the Garden of Gethsemane. And he asked his disciples to pray, you know, and he was in a lot of grief and anguish, and his sorrow was just, his heart was just crushed by the sorrow that he was experiencing, thinking of what he was going to undergo. And he asked them to stay, keep watch, and pray. So that three short phrases stay keep watch and pray that's what we are called to do during this Ignatian retreat is to stay with Jesus and then it becomes a way of life even after we finish our retreat we continue to stay with Jesus daily each moment and we pray ceaselessly and it becomes you know a habit for us and then Jesus went, you know, he um, went a little bit further. He fell on the ground and he prayed and he asked his father to take the cup of suffering, but only if it is God's will. So in our life, we are all going to go through some trials and difficulty. We may already be going through. And we can remember Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane to get our strength to drink that bitter cup of suffering that we are undergoing. And when Jesus returned, each time he saw that the disciples, three times he came back to and asked them to pray, but he came back and he saw that they were sleeping. 
So the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So that's another phrase to remember in our Ignatian spirituality retreat. We're trying to strengthen the spirit so it can overcome the weaknesses of the flesh. So at that point, when Jesus realized that he's going to be suffering and dying alone, he just went and he accepted the will of his heavenly father. And the prayer of the three disciples is, was really not for Jesus, but rather for the disciples themselves to be able to overcome the temptation to abandon Jesus during his hour of passion. And maybe it did help them to some extent that at least they didn't totally abandon him like Judas did. You know, they didn't despair, but you know, they did have trust and love for him. But we know that Judas also was in the Garden of Gethsemane, but he came to betray Jesus with the soldiers. And when the soldiers arrived there, they saw Jesus, and Jesus said, I am he. And that was the substantive words from Jesus' mouth. And the soldiers, they fell on the ground because they knew that this was the Son of God. He was the Messiah. But did that stop them? No. Even though they experienced a supernatural moment of grace in their soul, in their heart, and it was so transformative and so powerful that it had a physical reaction in them, they still went ahead and arrested him. So how often do we experience so many consolations and, you know, a few days later, we are back to like the way we were before. So we have to remember that those moments, we, you know, we go back to those moments, those Kairos moments, we have to go back to those to keep us um, with the Lord, to stay with the Lord and to remain faithful. And Jesus, even in that distressing situation, is always thinking of the others. So he says, okay, you can arrest me, but let my disciples go. And then when Peter um, cuts off the ear of the slave, of the, one of the soldiers, he says Peter to put the sword back in the bag and he's pick, you know he heals the slave so he's again trying to teach us about sacrificial love and how there is so many paths and so many opportunities where we can easily turn over our hearts to hatred but he wants us to stay focused on loving on forgiving and to endure persecutions like he did and in the Garden of Olives, after from there, he was taken to uh, Caiaphas, house of Caiaphas, the high priest, who had just been replaced, uh, like uh, whose father-in-law was the high priest for decades, and he was just replaced. So people valued Anus, his valued his judgment over Caiaphas. So that's why he goes first, to, Jesus is taken first to the father-in-law of Caiaphas. And after that, after uh, Caiaphas, uh, you know, he also is the one who says uh, it's better for one man to die than for all the people to be misled, you know. Let us save the rest. So that was a prophetic words that he said because that's exactly what Jesus did. But Jesus would have died even if there was just one person to save. You know, it's the difference between the human nature and the God nature. And whereas Annas, he was only critical, he was just scrutinizing Jesus for two things. First thing, he wanted to find out if Jesus had other disciples because his goal was not only to, um, uh, you know, to condemn Jesus, but also to find out who were all the people with Jesus. And he wanted them also to, to be arrested. And the other thing he was asking Jesus was um, of he was trying to find out if Jesus truly believed that he was the son of God. So he was trying to interrogate Jesus in many ways. And so we know there was real eminent threat to the disciples. And that's why Peter denied Jesus three times and all the apostles fled except John. And John, I believe, was able to withstand the temptation to flee because he was with the Blessed One. He was close with the Blessed Virgin Mary and he derived 
his strength from our mother. And the next morning, Jesus is sent to Pilate, and Pilate also knew there was something uniquely authentic about Jesus. There were so many people who had claimed to be the Messiah, but he knew that Jesus was different. And he didn't want to condemn Jesus, but he was fearful for his own life, and that's why he did not release Jesus. And we know that Jesus carried his own cross, and he... Uh, started the way of the cross at 9 a.m., the same time when the sacrificial animals are brought to the temple. And there is a big similarity between what was happening in the temple and what was happening to Jesus. And there is this beautiful um, series by Scott Hahn that talks about, you know, just this passion. And I think there are many scholars, who, biblical scholars who have done a comparison between the Passover sacrifice and what Jesus went through on that. And that's a beautiful meditation. And again, Jesus was not, even in his death, he was just one of the three criminals that were crucified. He didn't have, you know, the theme of suffering, humility, obscurity continues on even the way he died. And while he was standing by the cross, John um, supporting Mary, and I can see Jesus looking down and deriving some consolation from their presence and giving his mother to John and John to his mother. And we know that Mary always leads us and everyone to Jesus. She never takes the glory to herself. She's always leading people to her son. And at three o'clock, we know Jesus died. So we did that in th and we continue on with that, um, the burial uh, in week four, our week four, but St. Ignatius's week three doesn't end until Monday. So. On Tuesday onwards, the reflections would be on the resurrection. That's the official start of St. Ignatius's week four. So first week we focused on the purgation of the spirit. We uh, became aware of the areas that needed how to uh, reform and how to identify and root out sin uh, by including one or two examination of conscience each day and then at least spending about 30 minutes in meditation or whatever that we are able to commit to. But making those, uh, the exam and meditation in these 30 days, it's almost like a practice time and then after 30 days it becomes a way of life. So that's kind of our goal. So even if you're only able to meditate for five minutes, it's still something that you've, in, you've uh, included in your way of life. In the second week, we saw those two standards of uh, Christ the King and Lucifer, and we talked about the discernment of spirit and the nativity and all those things. Week, week three, we um, also saw about the public ministry of Jesus, and we re reflected on how to serve God as a true disciple through the three degrees of humility, the highest degree being the one where we do everything for the glory of God. The first degree was where we do, um, you know, we try to avoid mortal sins. And then the second degree was we even don't commit the venial sins. But then the third, the highest degree of humility is to actually do everything for the glory of God. And I think that was uh, week three. Uh, our elongated week three will end on Monday. And um, we will, for week four, it's all about the resurrection and the apparitions after the resurrection. So you will enjoy that. So I'm going to f finish the, you know, little bit of a, a summary because I know the first week I didn't do summarization because I do have people who are watching online. So I'm going to summarize some of those reflections because they probably would not be using the book for their meditation. So after, you know, Jesus' death, we um, see that um, even before Jesus dies, he shares his expectation of us. So before, like as he's going towards his passion, he's giving us like 
he shares his expectation of us because he's praying for us and for you know you, so he's praying for his disciples and for those who are going to believe in him through the apostles and their successors and Jesus says two things first he says that we need to be of one mind and one heart as a body of Christ and then he says complete we have to be completely one with each other and with Jesus so really the two aspects you can think of the cross as the horizontal which is our, the love for one another and then the vertical which is the love between us and God so he, he's he's saying that only by our love and how we lead that life of one mind and one heart the, the world is going to know that he was truly God so that the world that does not yet belong to Jesus will see us and believe that Jesus did indeed come down from heaven and that he is truly the God incarnate who has come to take us to himself and then after that prayer that's when he goes to the garden of olives uh, you know to and then we see all those other um, things that i just shared so for through jesus who is a word of god everything um, invisible to us is made visible the face of god is made visible to us through the face of jesus and everything was created through him visible and invisible but now he's making himself visible to us you know god himself is making him uh, us see his face and often times when we are experiencing persecutions um we see that the, even the enemies will join hands like two enemies opposing groups would join hand when when they are persecuting a group of righteous we see that happening with jesus and you know we see the romans and the jews they hate each other you know they are enemies but they join together when it came to um persecuting jesus and so they arrested him they bound him and they took him to um kaipas's house so all that we saw so i think at this point i'm going to go to the actual so i wrote a few meditations or two few points of reflection on the seven last words of jesus on the cross when so when jesus was on the cross he uh, said you know seven last words you've heard about the father forgive them for they know not what they do so that is basically love our enemies and pray for our persecutors and um uh, today you will be with me in paradise he says this to the thief the good thief so again that we see the mercy and unconditional love that even in the last moment of our death we can um get you know we, we can be touched by the mercy of god and then we saw a woman behold your son son behold your mother so that's where jesus gave his mother standing by the cross to his disciple and then the fourth one was the abandonment my god my god why have you forsaken me jesus was so completely alone in that moment and in such pain and suffering that it's unimaginable but he took that experience on on our behalf you know this is like um where he carries all of our sins and so much of you know he's he's taken on all our sins that he's so far removed from the heavenly father he can feel that separation and when he says i thirst that was another of the phrase that jesus says he knew that he had done the will of the heavenly father and everything was completed and at that time he spoke the words i word i, I thirst and this has been spiritually interpreted as jesus is thirsting for our souls however we can also say that jesus at the peak of his passion experienced a great sense of abandonment abandonment even by his heavenly father and, and an intense thirst for the heavenly father so this is you know he experienced this thirst for the heavenly father on behalf of all of us and he experienced that separation from his heavenly father as he bore the sins of the whole world on himself so this is the mystery of jesus's humanity while being fully divine 
he willingly accepted to put on the human nature on behalf of us to win the eternal crown for us. Then after that full abandonment, experiencing all of that thirst, then he said it is finished and he drank the cup of wine, the third cup of the Passover meal, which Jesus did not drink the third cup during the Seder meal, but he drank that on the cross before his death on the cross. That is when his mission was fulfilled and Jesus said, it is finished. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Then Jesus gave a loud cry, uh, bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. And in the gospels we will be meditating. You can choose any one of the gospels which you, you know, which you like, but I, I like John, but you can choose Mark or Matthew. And then in the Gospels, we read that on that particular day, there was an eclipse. The sky was dark and then there was an earthquake. And the curtain separating the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple area was torn in two. Every detail surrounding the death of Jesus had great significance in salvation history. Because the curtain tearing was Jesus' own body that's being torn to open the common area and the holy of holies which is a restricted area so it's like reconciling us back to god is happening by the tearing of jesus body that's the significance of the sign of peace that we say during mass the sign of peace is not the kind of peace that you say you know it's, it's not mindfulness peace. It is, mindfulness is great, but this is a peace where we are reconciled back to God. And that's a peace that the priest gives to the community on behalf of Jesus. And the priest is Jesus in the Mass. You know, you're representing Jesus. And the soldiers and the bystanders at the foot of the cross knew at that moment it was such a... Um, substantial moment that they knew that Jesus was the Son of God. They didn't have, until that point they were mocking him, but when Jesus gave up his spirit, they knew that he was the Son of God. There was something unique, different and authentic about Jesus because these soldiers, this was their job, they did this every day. But then you hear them exclaiming in the end that truly he was the Son of God. They were trying to test him, you know, they were trying to think that if he was truly the Messiah, that he would not die, but he would come down from the cross and he would overthrow the Roman Empire and politically liberate Israel. In this sense, there was much at stake. Jesus could have worked a miracle. He could have brought the angels from heaven, politically overthrown the whole Roman Empire, but he did the will of the Heavenly Father, which was to accept his passion and the humiliation. And he fulfilled it all the way to the end. And because Jesus had been scourged and he had been crowned with thorns, and he had carried his cross, he had suffered so many blows from the soldiers, and he had been in that pit all night in Caiaphas' house. He had lost so much blood that he died within three hours of being nailed to the cross. So when they finished and you know they wanted to come and take, because it was a Sabbath the next day, so when they wished to take down the bodies of those crucified prior to the Sabbath day, they broke the legs of the other two thieves who were crucified with Jesus to quicken their death because they were still alive. However, when they saw Jesus was already dead, they did not do that. Instead, they pierced his side and blood and water gushed forth out of the side of Jesus. So every detail, blood signifying the Holy Eucharist, water signifying the waters of baptism. The two essential sacraments of grace Jesus gave us, even in his agony and by his death. 
And this originates a devotion to the sacred heart of Jesus, that the heart that was pierced for us. You know, Jesus fulfilled every detail of his father's plan for our salvation. The Passover regulation required that the bones of the lamb are not to be broken. The sacrificial lamb's bones are not to be broken. So we read this in Exodus chapter 12 and Numbers chapter 9. And so Jesus died before they could break the bones of his bone. And also we read in Zechariah chapter 12, they, they will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child. And Jesus was the only begotten child of God and grieved bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. Again, the firstborn son in the Passover episode, it was a firstborn son, you know, that was um, struck down. So here Jesus is being struck down on behalf of all of us. He's that lamb. I can picture, you know, as Jesus is there, I know that it was an eclipse and the whole scene was dark because it says the sun refused to shine. I like that word, that phrase, the sun refused to shine because Jesus is symbolized by the sun that gives, you know, light to us. The sun is a symbol of Jesus and it refused to shine because Jesus died. And, but I see that there's a, as I reflect, I always see, and I know many people have shared this with me, including some saints, that there is a glow around Jesus' body, a faint, luminous glow emanating from Jesus' body because Jesus is the light of the world. And when Jesus was taken down from the cross, a cloth was used to cover his head and his face because it's you know, all the blood and the bodily fluids come out as soon as a person dies. And this is the sudarium, which our ancestors, especially on the Byzantine side, but also on the Latin rite, you know, the Roman Catholic Church, they pre preserved it for veneration for many centuries. And it has left marks of blood and fluids from the face of Jesus and his head on this cloth. And the two wealthy men, Nicodemus and jo uh, Joseph of Arimathea, both highly influential Jewish uh, leaders, they were afraid of their peers. They were fearful for their lives. But then they went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. And you can say these two friends of Jesus represent people who had previously lived a cowardly life of faith, but living their faith in secret because they are afraid of being discriminated, afraid of persecution, but then they are transformed, they are brave. They are no longer afraid. They go straight to Pilate's house and ask for the body of Jesus and they cover him with the shroud, which again has a, uh, it's been venerated for many, many, many centuries. It's, it's in Milan and Turin, shroud of Turin. And we know that um, the Sudarium is also there. I forget where, I think it's probably in Spain, I'm not sure. But it's, the Sudarium is there as well. And Jesus, just as he promised, he rose on the third day. The days in between his death and his resurrection, Jesus preached the good news to the patriarchs, to the prophets, and all the Old Testament saints who were waiting in limbo for the Messiah. So Jesus goes to them and he preaches the good news to them. And so many people, uh, many saints rose from their grave on the day of Jesus' crucifixion. This is in the Gospels. And in one of the Gospels, I forget which one. And they appeared, both body and soul, to their relatives in Jerusalem before ascending to heaven. And this is even before Jesus rose from the dead. This is, you know, this is what 
because these were all signs so that the disciples would remain steadfast, that people would continue to believe. So even after Jesus died, he continued to work these signs and wonders to keep encouraging us. And a great light emanated, I'm sure, from his body as he rose, that it left that imprint on the shroud. It's like the negative of a photo on his burial cloth, the Shroud of Turin. There must have been a very intense, quick heat and light to leave that imprint so accurate. And the recent research shows that the Sudarium and the Shroud of Turin are from the same person, the same kinds of um, trauma suffered by both um, the, pers the person who uh, was covered in those two cloth, the sudarium and the shroud. The face of Jesus in the shroud and the sudarium match, and the wounds and the scars match. And it has been, uh, um, also the blood group matches with the uh, Eucharistic miracles. I think I told that also. We know that there was also an earthquake at the resurrection of Jesus. And the soldiers who were guarding the tomb, again, experienced this great phenomena, but they didn't believe. So when we have faith, we don't need any signs, but when we are not far away from God and we don't have faith, no matter what signs we see, our heart will be closed and hardened. So we have to pray. We have to pray for our hearts to be softened. We have to pray for the hearts of everyone to be softened and the minds to be eliminated. So we will be touched by the, uh, the signs and that they will come to faith. So Jesus, we know that the identity of Jesus Christ, we know that he was a teacher, a prophet, um, but he was most importantly the Messiah, the Son of God. And the authorities silenced these soldiers. They didn't, you know, they didn't uh, have a change of heart. And Jesus came from the Father and after completing his mission, he was returning back to the Father. He has no beginning, he has no end. He was always there. He always was, he always is, and he always will be from the book of Revelation. He came in flesh into time and space for our sake. And we know that God only because there's no one who's come from heaven. We know God through Jesus. We, every word we speak must have also its source in Jesus because we are the body of Christ. So if we speak our own ideas and thoughts, even though it's not a sin, but it's, it's definitely an imperfection that we must be sorry for and make every effort to like change and be more docile to the Holy Spirit and try to improve because every word we speak, we have to speak what Jesus wants us to speak. So having that disposition of heart, that sensitivity of heart, Jesus spoke the words of his Father and not for his own glory but to glorify God the Father. And his words and our words, when spoken with this disposition, it will be honest, it will be true, and there will be nothing false, or there will be no duplicity in them. And that's kind of the litmus test to see if our words are spoken with Jesus or are they our own words. The litmus test would be that it would be honest and there would be truth, because Jesus is the truth with a capital T. So there is a set of meditations on the apparitions that are wonderful and beautiful. So you can use your imagination and you can put yourself in those scene and you'll see that the very first apparition was Jesus' visit to his mother. And this is not recorded in the gospel but it is a pious tradition in the Catholic Church and in the Orthodox Church. It's an understanding, even before the Gospels were written, that Jesus first appeared to his mother.
And the first recorded apparition was, of course, to Mary Magdalene. She finds the empty tomb. She runs to uh, Peter. Again, we see the, in the Gospels, you know, if we see properly, we will see that Peter was the chief apostle. And we see John, the beloved disciple of Jesus, follows Peter into the tomb. So again, every detail is so important. So the rest of the apostles, they were following Peter. Peter, the primacy of Peter. These details are important for it shows that Peter is the chief apostle as Jesus himself had assigned this role to him. And we remain under the one good shepherd, Jesus Christ, who has assigned Peter and his successors to be the visible head, his visible head on earth. But we don't say that, you know, Peter and his successor is the head. Jesus is our head, of course. <laughs> but the visible head, the representative is Peter. Peter and John immediately left to tell the other disciples, but Mary Magdalene would not leave the tomb. She stayed there and she wept. She's like, oh, where did Jesus' body go? Did somebody come and take it away? And then she was patiently waiting there, crying, and Jesus appeared to her. So that was the first apparition. And he asked her to not hold on to him, for he must ascend to the Father. And Jesus appeared after that to the apostles, and when he first appeared to them, he doesn't confront them for their lack of faith and for abandoning him during his passion and death, but rather he says, peace be with you. So that he does not accuse, he does not blame, he's not upset or angry, he is always, peace be with you. And that should be our disposition towards those who are sometimes not very nice to us. Our first reaction is when we see them, we're going to tell them, give them a piece of our mind. No, we got to step, step away from that and say, peace be with you and forgive. And this is all Jesus trying to model for us on how we need to conform our lives to his, the way he lived. So this is all for our benefit. And this is the gospel good news that God has forgiven and forgotten our sins. And he gives us undeserved peace. Then he breathes the Holy Spirit on the disciples and he sends them on the mission to bring this good news of forgiveness and reconciliation, the good news of the gospel to the whole world, starting with Jerusalem and, you know, expanding from there. And Thomas was not with the apostles, so when Jesus appeared to the, uh, the apostles, Thomas was not there and when he heard about it, he did not believe that Jesus was truly risen. So Jesus appears again, and this time particularly for Thomas, and he said, stop doubting and believe. And Jesus tells us that those who walk in faith without the experience of miracles, apparitions, or healing are more blessed. So may the risen Lord give us the peace that surpasses understanding. And Jesus appears the third time to seven of the apostles who had seen the Lord but were still not sure what they were to do and how to lead their lives without Jesus because Jesus' constant physical presence and leadership without that they didn't know what to do so they had to live and they had to find a means to for a livelihood so they went back into fishing and they caught nothing so we see them, they return back to fishing, but they caught no fish. A sign that when God has a mission for us, our natural efforts will not bear fruit. Then Jesus appears and asks them to cast the net on the right side. And as the sun rose, they caught so much fish that they could not pull the net back into the boat. And it's a beautiful symbol of our church being the boat. And I see that when we, are, when we open our hearts and welcome those who are not cradle Catholics, as Jesus would, like, into our common faith, and when we take our gospel to them under Peter and um, through the sacraments of the church, we will be unable to fit all of them into our current churches. 
that we would have to build more churches instead of closing churches down due to the lack of attendance or you know other issues because we are all called to be evangelizers to those who are seeking the Messiah, the Savior, but in their own way, who don't even know they're looking for him. And so we are that little spark that's going out into the world to be evangelizers through our way of life. And here we see the apostles who were first chosen by Jesus. Then he confirms their faith in the resurrection by his appearance. Finally, he gives them their mission. So it's like a step-by-step he does choose, then he confirms their faith, and then he gives them the mission. And so we are each chosen, we are given the grace of faith, and now we have a mission to accomplish. And then the fish and bread that uh, represents the members of the body of Christ, in this case, he is just making fish, uh, you know, on the charcoal fire. That's not the sacrament of the Eucharist, it's, it's a symbol, symbolizes it, but uh, for the sacrament of the Eucharist, it, the species of bread and wine is necessary. But it's symbolic of the Eucharist and the body of um, Christ, the church. So, and then Jesus says in Matthew chapter 4, 19, Come after me and I will make you fishers of men. So again, there is this evangelization. And then the question here is, why is it always mentioned in the gospel that Peter was the first to recognize Jesus or to do or say something? Um, why is there always a lead and follow dynamic between Peter and the apostles? It's because Jesus chose him as their leader. It's not because he deserved it, but he was chosen by our Lord. He was given that role. So there are many holy people who were probably way more holier than so many of our previous popes and everything, but it's Jesus who chooses them through the Holy Spirit, power of the Holy Spirit working in the church over the centuries. So Peter recognizing Jesus, he recognized Jesus, put on some clothes, and then he swam across. And, you know, that, that is compared to Adam and Eve who recognized that they, they were naked when they heard the voice of God. In the same way, we see Peter is the one who recognizes that and he puts on the clothes and he swims towards Jesus. And then Jesus is saying to us, come have breakfast. So Jesus is always eager to feed us, um, both with spiritual and bodily nourishment every day of our lives. The true shepherd feeds his sheep and lamb. Unlike the false shepherd, the devil who comes to steal, kill and destroy, the true shepherd feeds his sheep and lamb. And in the Maslow, uh, Maslow's pyramid of human needs, I don't know if you've heard about it, but it says that the bodily needs, uh, necessities like food, clothing, and shelter are often needed before a person can aspire to higher spiritual things. However, in our faith, we kind of live the opposite way. We seek the spiritual. We seek the spiritual first, seek first the kingdom of God, and God gives us the bodily needs as well. We deny the flesh and we aspire for the spirit. We want the spirit to rule over the body so and the mind. So in here we see in this apparition, Jesus uh, cooks the breakfast, he feeds the apostles. Then after they had eaten, he singled out Peter again and he reaffirmed his leadership role in the church by asking him three times, the same number of times that he denied Jesus, if he loved him. This shows a perfection and completeness. Peter had totally abandoned and denied his friendship with Jesus, and now he totally abandons himself into the hands of Jesus. Filled with perfect love for his master and savior, he takes on the role to lead the apostles in continuing the mission of Christ, to bring the good news to the whole world for many generations to come until the end of time. And Jesus asks, Peter tries to draw out of his heart and mind firm faith, intense love, not lukewarmness. So th this is, yes, it's this simple, uneducated fisherman has become the chief shepherd and the first of all popes in God's kingdom on earth. God's ways are not our ways. It's always about our ways and his thoughts and um, they are higher than even all our collective wisdom over the centuries. So we have to trust that
God chooses our hopes for us. And um, Jesus asked him to take care of the lambs and the sheep. And of course, we are the lambs and the sheep. And we are all, all Christians are lambs and sheep. We don't belong to like, we belong to Jesus. We don't belong to like Andrew or Thomas or Peter. I know like the um, Orthodox, they feel they belong to Andrew. And then you have um, Thomas Christians in India. And you have the Coptics who feel they belong to St. Mark. But really, we all belong to Jesus. And Peter is our chief shepherd for all of us. And there's only one Jesus, there's only one communion. So we, you know, we uh, believe that Jesus is wisdom. Uh, he is God, so. And Jesus is the wine, we are the branches. And Peter is a visible head of the church on earth. And um, Jesus asked Peter to follow him and to follow Jesus closely in his footstep will lead us, like it did Peter, through the way of the cross and to Golgotha where he died and he rose up so we could have eternal life. It will be a narrow, difficult path. And also we'll be meditating on the road to Emmaus, which is again the, the recognition of Jesus in the breaking of the bread. And we have the apostles who met often with Mary to pray after the resurrection. Um, and for 40 days after Jesus appeared to them on his final appearance on the Mount of Olives, Jesus asked them to wait and pray for the power of the Holy Spirit so they can be witnesses in Jerusalem, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And as they were watching, Jesus was taken up to heaven in a cloud. And they saw two angels who said to them that Jesus will come back in the same way. Then the apostles went back to the upper room where Mary was, I'm sure, and they prayed with her. You know, when we belong to Jesus, we go where he goes, which is to heaven. So Jesus reigns in heaven and he will come and take us to be with him. We, we start reigning with him even now while we are here on earth. And Jesus, before his passion, said that, my father's house has many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would not have told you because I'm going there to prepare a place for you in John chapter 14, verse 2. So we will behold him in glory in heaven. And we, can, we have glimpses of that when we pray ceaselessly. And as often as we think of him, even for a moment, we are already in heaven with him. And especially when we celebrate Holy Eucharist. And Jesus is our king and um, we reign in union with him and that's the miracle of the Eucharist um, but now we must accept the thorns because that is not a crown of um, gold and precious stones that is a crown of thorns that we have to accept while we are here and we must walk the uh, way of the cross not going to be a red carpet. We must die to ourselves on the cross like Jesus, giving up our will and accepting the divine will of God, our Father, in all circumstances of our life. And increasing in divine love and removing hatred from our heart and saying no to the seductions and the corruption of Lucifer and foregoing riches and ambitions and embracing the truth embracing poverty, embracing humility and obscurity. That's the way of the cross. Then we too will share the glory of Jesus. Our bodies will be glorified too. We'll experience a similar nature like how Jesus um, uh, was, you know, he was able to appear within closed doors. All those um, attributes of Jesus' glorified body after resurrection we will also experience those at the end of time. Our body will be perfected. There will be no more pain, no more sickness, no more death. And our intellect will be freed. Our memory will be purified completely and our will will be perfected. There will be no more sadness, no more sin or temptations. 
our spirit will enjoy full communion with God, we'll be in continuous ecstasy, there'll be no separation from God, and also we'll be reunited with all of our loved ones, and we will love one another perfectly too. So we see a glimpse of this in our life when we meditate in contemplation and ecstasy, but we will have the perfected fullness of it in heaven. And of course, we'll see our Blessed Mother, so that is one of the meditations um, which you're going to enjoy this week is on uh, our Blessed Mother, Mother of God. So Mary was chosen to give flesh to the eternal Word of God who existed before time and before the creation of the universe. In fact, Jesus, if you think about it, derived his body and blood from Mary in her womb. So when we receive the Eucharist, we are in a way re receiving the, you know, the derived body and blood of Jesus from Mary. So uh, Jesus is the incarnated God, man, and Mary is his mother. And so she is the mother of God. So she is the greatest sign and witness to all of us that Jesus, uh, you know, by remaining a virgin and a mother at the same time, that's the main sign that God gave to the people of Israel to recognize their savior, that a virgin will bear a son. So Mary, through her fiat, became the fulfillment of that sign in the book, in the Old Testament book. I don't remember the exact, um, I think it was in Hosea maybe, I don't know. But she remained a virgin when she miraculously conceived baby Jesus in her womb at the Annunciation. And she also miraculously delivered baby Jesus without the pangs of birth, and she remained a virgin during and after the birth of Jesus. So Mary is the most, uh, the first and the primary disciple of Jesus, and is an amazing witness to our Savior Jesus Christ, just her being. Not only did Mary have to say yes to conceive Jesus in her womb, she also had to consent to allow and accompany her son to go through the passion. Mary's yes was essential and her, uh, you know, it shows how much she cared about our salvation. Her yes was as essential for Jesus' incarnation but also for his passion and death, the kind of death he was going to undergo. She had to say yes to all those things. You know, it's easy for a mother to say, yes, okay, I can have a baby supernaturally, but it's very hard for a mother to say yes to let her son die the way he died. You know? So, she has that same motherly concern she had for Jesus for each one of us. So she's with us, and through Mary, we conceive Jesus in our heart. She is our spiritual mother. She put baby Jesus in our heart. Mary did whatever God told her to do. She asked us to do the same. And what does it mean to you to do whatever Jesus tells you to do? That's something that you can reflect on. How can you say yes? How can you say your fiat every moment like Mary did? Now, when the angel announced the virgin birth to Mary and the angel also announced the birth to Zechariah, the, uh, John the Baptist. But Zechariah was struck dumb and then Mary was not struck dumb because why is the difference? You know, some people might think, why, why did, uh, you know, Zechariah get punished? But the main reason is because Mary believed. Zechariah didn't believe. Zechariah wanted a sign to believe that his wife would conceive in her old age. But Mary, she didn't ask for a sign. She believed right away. She trusted God, that God is able to do the impossible. Only thing she wished to know is how it's gonna unfold because she was a virgin. So we have to be trusting. We should not be seeking for signs and all these you know, mystical experiences. They're fine, but if God allows them, great, but we should be people of faith. For Mary and Joseph, they both had 
very, in, at a very young age committed to perpetual virginity, perpetual celibacy from childhood. So she, even though they were engaged to each other, she was, you know, wanted to know how it's going to happen. So she was, un, she was aware of the scripture prophecy that, you know, that uh, the, the, uh, of the virgin birth. So she's given the explanation Gabriel gives the explanation that the Holy Spirit will overshadow her and she will conceive baby Jesus. But then she's also given the sign saying her cousin Elizabeth, who was barren, will have a child. So when we don't ask for a sign, we get the sign as well. So when we believe without doubting or rather without seeking signs, we show that we trust God has our life in his hands. God who is good will give us the signs, the visions, whatever we need to remain faithful to him until the end. After the birth of Jesus, myriads of angels appeared to the shepherds, you know, in the field and asked them to tell Mary and Joseph what the angels told them and that Jesus is going to be the Prince of Peace, he's going to bring the good news, the, the great joy to all people, that he's a savior, that he's Christ, all those things. So the shepherds were again sent to give that confirmation, that sign. And Mary and Joseph, they thought about it. And it says, Mary thought deeply about it and remembered everything she heard. And often she is seen pondering and reflecting. She was a contemplative, the first contemplative in our order, deepest contemplative. And then the 40-day-old <clears throat> baby was taken to the temple in Jerusalem, presentation, and <coughs> Mary and Joseph were not strangers in the temple because they lived in the temple, the service of God, for much of their childhood. So when Prophet Simeon and Prophet, Prophetess Anna, they knew Mary and Joseph, and they were probably aware of the vision of Zechariah, more than likely, they probably also knew the Annunciation event in Mary's life. And so they fully accepted and they were overjoyed when they you know, saw Jesus, they, that they were able to see the Messiah while they were still alive. That promise came to pass. And then the little baby Jesus was circumcised on the day of the presentation and uh, Mary was forewarned by uh, Simeon that the little baby Messiah was going to suffer and die. So he, you know, was a good teacher to Mary, the young girl. Um, basically, he, they knew, Simeon and Anna knew, the Messiah was not going to be this pompous king who's going to come and overthrow the Roman Empire, but he's going to be this suffering king. Simon was truly wise and understood the scriptures rightly. For most of the teachers of the law of that time, and the people who taught the scriptures during that time, were expecting a political messiah, not a spiritual messiah who came to liberate once and for all time peoples from the consequence of the original sin of Adam and Eve. So not about the temporal liberation, but the permanent one-time liberation of all creation from the effects and consequences of original sin. And the reason Simeon and Anna, they depended on God for understanding the prophecies in the scripture, the prayer and fasting. They did not place their trust in their own intellectual capabilities and their own human knowledge to understand the divine plan of salvation. They were looking to God to give that understanding to them. Similarly, those who pray, and again, this is a pitch for prayer and meditation, in case you're wondering what I'm trying to get at here is that when we pursue the path of prayer, meditation, and contemplation, we don't need to rely on our own skills, our own knowledge. Um, but in, if, in faith, if we depend on God, God infuses those knowledge, that understanding, gives us the words, and he teaches us these supernatural things that will help us on our journey and help others on their journey through us. And we know that after Jesus' um, uh, resurrection and ascension, Mary and John, they lived in Ephesus in Turkey. And uh, her assumption, uh, when she reached the end of her earthly life, um, 
did her soul separate from her body because she didn't have she was conceived without the original sin um, so the church I believe says the the soul and body did separate but she didn't experience the pain and effects of death no she didn't experience it because she was uh, just like in her childbirth she didn't experience the pain of childbirth because that's a consequence of sin so Mary didn't experience the pain and effects of death but she did have her body and soul separated like Jesus body and soul were separated for you know those two days um, and she reversed the curse of sin and death through her collaboration with the salvific grace of Christ so she didn't experience death but rather she just she slept this, this, it's called the dormition so theologically it would make sense if she didn't experience death, just like how she didn't experience the pangs of childbirth um, but and um, yeah so so did Mary wish to some people think she did experience death like Jesus because she wished to suffer and experience death like Jesus did well this is my own answer for that is God could have allowed her to su su suffer or experience that suffering spiritually and mystically at the time of Jesus' crucifixion without her actually going, undergoing that physical death. You know? So that's what I think. And I think the church doesn't really teach that uh, she... I, I think the Catholic Church doesn't teach one way or the other, but the Orthodox Church is say that she slept I think I'm not positive but now other question would be where did Mary um, Mary's dormition take place was it in Ephesus or was it in Jerusalem the pious legend is that Mary came from Ephesus to Jerusalem and it was in Jerusalem that she experienced her dormition but it's possible that it was in Ephesus we don't know because now, if you go to Holy Land, there is a chapel for dormition in Jerusalem. But I know there is one in Ephesus as well. But we do know that Mary was assumed into heaven from the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. Because that is the same place and it is the same. And in the same way Jesus ascended to heaven, she also ascended to heaven. So if she went to sleep in dormition, it's possible that suddenly her body disappeared and she was in Jerusalem in an instant and she ascended or assumed into heaven not ascended assumed into she was assumed into heaven and Jesus himself came to bring her up to heaven along of course with the angels so you, you will be meditating on the assumption and uh, Mary's ascension would have been very similar to the ascension of Jesus and the, the image of Mary praying in the upper room with the apostles in Jerusalem is, is a reminder of the faithfulness of our Blessed Mother. She never leaves us alone, you know, she was teaching. In fact, I'm listening to this book that Laura suggested, uh, Mystical City of God, and I'm really curious to know how all these things will happen. I'm still not there yet, but I'm still in her... Where am I? I'm still in her childhood, I think. But I want to uh, see what, you know, if these things that we meditate and reflect, how does it reflect with some of the things that the saints have been, um, you know, our Blessed Mother revealed to this saint some of her life events that's in that book, Mystical City of God. So you can also, you know, look it up online or you can buy the books. But, um, it's nice to reflect on your own first before, you know, listening to another person's reflection. But we know that Jesus is seated at the right hand of God the Father, and Mary is seated at the right hand of Jesus. So we have Jesus, and on his right side, we have Mary. And Mary's presence always brings comfort especially to those who are grieving, those who are suffering. She's this tender, compassionate mother who always brings mildness, gentleness, joy. 
and uh, she is the Ark of the Covenant that contains like, and we are supposed to be like Mary, and she is the Ark of the Covenant that contains the new Ark of the Covenant, the bread of life, Jesus, and the rod of Jesse, the cross, and the tablets of the covenant, the love of God and neighbor. We see that in perfection lived out in the life of Mary. And she's constantly interceding for us with her son because she is our queen mother. And she is seen in the book of Revelation as a woman clothed with the sun with the moon under her feet. And I dedicate my children who are called Sunny and Moon to our Blessed Mother. And I always love this book of Revelation vision of the woman clothed with the sun and with the moon because Mary stands for um, on the moon for Mary is like the moon that reflects the glory of her son Jesus represented by the sun she's always reflecting the values and the virtues and the goodness of Jesus to us with a crown of 12 stars representing the 12 apostles and the 12 tribes of Israel and we know that as a Lady of Guadalupe, Mary brought Christ to the New World, that is the Americas in the 1535, is exactly like that Revelation chapter 12. And so wherever the gospel is preached, I think Mary always proceeds. So if you're going to be an evangelizer, you're going to be that Saint Ignatius' spark that's going to set the world on fire, it's going to be preceded by your devotion to Mary because Mary is going to you know go before you to wherever you're going and the words that um, came to me I was found by those who are not seeking me you know this is very true in many apparitions of Mary where she appears to people who are not even seeking her like recently there was a not recently but a few decades ago, there was a many, many days of apparition in Egypt, which was predominantly a Muslim country. For many days, she appeared in Zaytun. So Jesus is found by those who are not even seeking him, and Mary is the one who appears and gives her baby Jesus, her son Jesus, to non-Christians, to people who are not even seeking him. And I know in India too, there are many apparitions, but this particular apparition of Our Lady of Good Health, Velankani, people of all religions, all faith come there and experience great miracles. It's called as the Lourdes of the East, but it's actually bigger than Lourdes. There's millions of people who come every year. And Many are non-believers, they are not, you know, they are not Christians, but they experience such great miracles because Our Lady is always bringing Jesus to people who don't know Jesus yet. And that's what Mary does, she does whatever God wants her to do. And she's asking us to do the same. She's asking us to do what Jesus would do. With that, I would like to end with this beautiful colloquy by Saint Bernard which is on our in our books page 192 um, which is going to be the end for our week um, three week four I do want to make a request um, so it's August 13th which, which is our final week I know the first day we, were, we wrote down some expectations and I was wondering if you could prepare like a testimony or, or just a sharing. Don't think of this testimony, more like a sharing if um, you could just prepare like 10 or 15 minutes. Maybe you can write a page uh, which basically says what were your expectations if it's something that you can share. Of course, if it's too personal, you don't want to share it, but if you can share what your expectations were and what you experienced during these 30 days and how that's changed going forward your way of life anything that you wish to share that would be wonderful so this would be for the 13th which would be our last meeting 
and on 13th we will speak of the love of God and uh, the diverse manners of prayer and I'll talk a little bit about contemplation just because as a Carmelite I want to say a few last things about contemplation and then there is some recommendations that St. Ignatius gives for uh, you know the last for the last day of the retreat because he knows that when we are in retreat we are in a you know very structured mode and then we need some kind of pointers and tips to keep that going for the rest of our lives so that's going to be um, our topics for our last and final week um, so if you could prepare that in, in writing I, I like to get a copy of it just for I like to read um, and pray for you it doesn't have to be elaborate. It can just be a small, short paragraph or a page, or, or if you want to write many pages, you're free to do that. I love to read, so more the better. But at least if you can write a few sentences, that would be wonderful. And Kim, if you could let Leo know um, that, you know, or I could email her. I'll, I'll email her. So page 192. So this is um, St. Bernard, and I think I'm going to start from Odal. So when you're ready, you, page 192, okay. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. O thou who feelest thyself tossed by the tempest in the midst of the shoals of this world, turn not away thine eyes from the star of the sea, if thou wouldst avoid shipwreck. If the winds of temptation blow, if turbulations rise up like rocks before thee, a look at the star, a sigh towards Mary. If the waves of pride, ambition, calumny, jealousy seek to swallow up thy soul, a look towards the star, a prayer to Mary. If anger, avarice, love of pleasure shiver thy frail bark, Seek the eyes of Mary. If honor, horror of thy sins, trouble of conscience, dread of the judgments of God, begin to plunge thee into the gulf of sadness, the abyss of despair, attach thy heart to Mary. In thy dangers, thy anguish, thy doubts, think of Mary. Call on Mary. Let Mary be on thy lips in thy heart and to the suffrage of her prayers lose not sight of the example of her virtues following her thou canst not wander whilst thou prayest to her thou canst not be without hope as long as thou thinkest of thou of her thou wilt be in the path thou canst not fall when she sustains thee Thou hast nothing to fear while she protects thee. If she favor thy voyage, thou wilt reach the harbor of safety without weariness. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, Spirit. Amen. Thank you for coming and um, we are two-thirds of our journey. We have only one-third to go so keep persevering. Ten more days, nine more days. So see you next Saturday.